Hello everyone, in this session I will explain the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank using the balance sheet and income statement, using their actual numbers. Now, as a viewer, you don't have to understand the technical concepts. I am going to explain the items that are relevant to this process in simple terms so you can keep up. So don't worry about this balance sheet that's in front of you. I will show you this balance sheet later on and it will make sense at the end of the day. To illustrate the concepts, I'm going to start from a bank that don't exist. It's going to take me two to three minutes. I'm going to create a balance sheet for the bank explaining the different accounts and therefore you understand the importance of each account. So then, then when I pull the actual balance sheet, it all will make sense for you. So let's assume I wanted to start a bank with a $10 million of capital. I'm going to call this bank Adams Bank. So simply put on my balance sheet, I invested 10 million. The bank will have 10 million in cash, Adams Bank, as of January 1st, 20X0. I have common stock of 10 million, all fine and dandy. Next thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this 10 million and start to buy property, asset, equipment to open the bank. So I, do, I took this $10 million that I have in cash and what I did during the year 20X0, which is I did not open yet, I purchased land, building and equipment, to open the bank. Now I have still have 10 million in assets and 10 million in equity. So nothing really happened so far. It just the bank existed and now they have land building and equipment. Now they can open their doors for business. So we open our doors for business in year X1, year one, and we accepted for the first quarter 20 million in deposits. Deposits mean the people deposited the money at your bank. So these deposits are loans to the bank. So when you deposit your money at the bank, yes, the bank will have more cash, but now they will have more liabilities. They will have more debt. So notice at the end of year X zero, we had $1 million in cash. By the first quarter of year one, we have 21 million in cash. How did we go from 1 million to 21 million? We have depositors. So notice here, the deposits are a liability for the bank. The bank have more cash, but they have deposits. Now, what do bank do? What do banks do? Well, banks need to make a profit. The banks need to invest these deposits to make a profit because they have to pay the depositors some sort of an interest rate. So they need to invest this money. So here's what's gonna happen. Adams Bank, by the third quarter, what they did, they took this 21 million, they lend out 2.5 million. First, before they lend out any million, we have to keep 10%. We're going to assume 10%. You have to keep it a mandatory reserve at the central bank. So they use 2 million from this 21 million as mandatory reserve. Then they lend out 2.5 million to people who wants to purchase homes, which is mortgage notes. They lend 3 million to personal as personal loans and they lend 5 million to business loans and this is what banks do so notice they have a they have loans now that's their assets this is the bank's asset what i have in yellow this is what's going to generate so if they're paying let's assume they're paying for the sake of simplicity 1% on their deposits they want to make maybe 8% on their investments therefore they will make a 7% difference as profit they will that that's why they can operate the bank and have some profit for the shareholders. So this is a simple banking system. Now, here's what I want you to notice here as well. Now, notice the banks still have 8.5 million in cash and 2 million in mandatory reserve. So as of right now, if all the depositors came and they want their money, we can cover 52.5% of their deposit. Now, the higher this ratio, the better off the bank is because let's assume all the depositors came today, you can you only have, you can only give them 50% of their money, but that's not what usually happens. That's not what the bank bank on, right? The bank, you know, the people don't come back for their money immediately, but the point is you have to have this ratio covered. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, farhatlectures.com. Farhat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's going to help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. No obligation, no credit card required. So let's assume further, the bank accepted, they were very popular, accepted 25 million in additional deposit. So notice from September 
year one till the end of year one then the next three quarters everybody likes this bank so what they did and you're going to see why i'm saying this in a moment we have 25 million in deposit so notice our deposit went from 20 million to 45 million and you're going to see how this all relate to svb shortly so what did we do with this 45 this additional 25 million well People are not buying homes. People are not asking for personal loan. There's no there's no need for business loan. So what are we going to do with this additional money? Remember, we had 8.5 as of September, and now we have an additional 25. What did we do with this money? We invested this money in U.S. government bonds. Simply put, we lend this money to the U.S. government, and we purchase bonds. And let's assume we purchased 3 million of short-term bonds and 25 million in long-term bonds which are called which we classify them from an accounting perspective i'll explain this in a moment as held to maturity now these bonds are considered these bonds are usa bonds united states government those are safe bonds they are considered safe bonds so guess what from a coverage or liquidity perspective if we take our cash and mandatory reserve plus our bonds if anything, our ratio of liquid asset to deposit, we, Im we improved our ratio. So, so far, so good. Nothing looks unusual. The only thing that looks unusual is we have a large proportion of our asset, 25 million out of 55 million of our assets are tied up in long-term bonds classified as held to maturity. Again, I'm going to explain what does that mean in a moment. Okay, so, so far, everything looks good. I'm just showing you how, how we are looking at a balance sheet. So once we pull SVB balance sheet, I don't have to explain it. It's, it's going to be simplified. That's the whole purpose of it. Now, why, what is, what is, what is important? Why did they, why did SVB or why did Adams Bank invested their money in those long-term health to maturity? Well, for one thing, Silicon Valley did not have any other options to lend otherwise. Well, why not? Because they did not have customers. They, they, they have a special type of customers. You're going to see SVB had a special type of customers. They don't lend to regular, in quote, regular people. You're going to see why in a moment. Two, why long-term bonds? Long-term bonds gives you a higher return, the highest return, a high, the high return. Why high return? Because if you lock your money with the government as at, for long term, they will pay you more interest rate. So the longer you are willing to lock your money to purchase long term bonds, the higher is the yield, the higher is the return. So what H, what SVB was doing, just like what Adam's doing is since they did not find a place to lend their money, which is the bank is in the business of lending money to people, to individual, to businesses. What they did, they, they what they did is they chased the yield. And that yield was not really that high. They were earning approximately 1.6%. But the alternative is earning nothing because they did not know what to do with the money. Just like Adams Bank, they just received that additional 25 million and they don't know what to do with it. So what is held to maturity? Well, held to maturity, you don't have to record any unrealized gain or unrealized loss. Now we're going to go a little bit technical and explain the concept. When you have an investment and that investment in bonds and that investment is classified as HTM, held to maturity, from an accounting perspective, you don't have to show any gains or any losses that are unrealized. Why? Because bonds go up in value, bonds go down in value. Well, since you are not selling the bond, don't worry about the fluctuation. Why? Because you're going to hold them to maturity. What does that mean? At maturity, the US government will be there and pay you the face value. So from an accounting perspective, you don't have to worry about recording those gains and losses because they are unrealized. And whether there's a fluctuation now, at the end, you're gonna get your 25 million because the US government is considered a reliable creditor, or at least we hope so. Or at least that's what we see in the near future. You know, if we think otherwise, it's a problem for everyone. So you would report those investments at amortized cost, unless, you need to sell them. So here's where the problem comes with SVB. What happened with SVB is this. They had losses in those bonds, which is fine. We had losses. It's not a big deal. We don't have to report them like if they don't exist. Now, why did we have losses? I'm going to explain this in a moment shortly. But unless you are forced, and why were you forced to sell those bonds? Well, if the depositors came back and they want their money, look, there's there's 45 million of 
45 million in dollars. Right now you have 6.5 million in cash and mandatory reserve. So if 10 million wants their money, you have to liquidate, you have to sell those bonds. If you have to sell those bonds and they are experiencing losses, now you have to report the losses. Now we're gonna explain why did that happen in a moment. Now the question was, the question is, the first question was, I just wanna clarify this point. Why did the government did not intervene? Why did the government did not intervene earlier seeing this picture? Well, here's why. There's, a, there's an act called Dodd-Frank, and we study this for the CPA exam. Dodd-Frank used to cover any banks that's greater than 50 billion in asset. And SVB was lower than 50 billion. So Dodd-Frank did not apply to SVB. At some point, SVB Inc. was higher than 50 billion. But what happened is the Dodd-Frank Act was adjusted to cover only banks above 250 billion. So the government did not look at SVB as closer as larger banks because the Dodd-Frank Act was amended and the bank will have to be more than 250 billion. So the bank was too small, less than 250 billion. Now, um, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to explain to you the depositors who were the depositors who were the depositors that's important and why did those hdm lost value two important concepts you need to understand in order to understand why svb collapse the first one is the customers of svb bank okay here we go only 2.7 percent of their deposits only two a small percentage of the people who had deposit of svb were insured up to 250,000. Let me explain this to you. Okay, if you have money in a US bank, the government, they have this program called this corporation, Federal Insurance Deposit Corporation, they will guarantee your deposit up to quarter of a million. So as long as you have quarter of a million dollar, you don't have to worry about the bank. SVB, they only had, of their total customers, it means 97.3% of their customers all had accounts greater than 250,000. So their customers, they have a special type of customers, high net worth customers versus a, comp a, a, a bank like Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, 40% of their customers are covered by the FDIC because they have deposits less than 250. Look at US Bank Corp, JP Morgan. But notice Signature Bank in Silicon Valley, which is Signature Bank was brought down after Silicon Valley, their, their customers are high net worth customers. Who are their customers? That's very important. The customers of SVB Bank, that's the initial, that's the initial, when SVB was created, it was created to serve initial public offering, startup company, venture capitalist. Those people, they have a lot of money and they need to invest them. Their executives, their CEOs, their executives, that's where they, they, they deposit their money. In 2021, we're going to see in a moment, in 2021, interest rate in year 2021, the Fed rate was close to zero. And what happened? Because the interest rate was low, there was a lot of money. There was a lot of quantitative easing. People had money. Investors had money. So what did they do? They invested all this money. There was a large inflow of deposits at SVB Bank. And we're going to see this shortly on their balance sheet. Okay? This is one picture of it. So you need to understand why did they have suddenly a large amount of money? Two reasons. Interest rate was low. And all their customers were venture capitalists. People with money that they need to invest it, they invest in IPOs. IPOs and their CEOs put their money in which bank? Silicon Valley Bank. Because you're going to see a huge spike in their deposits. Now, that's one, port one picture of it. The other picture that you need to understand is the increase in the Fed fund rate. In 22 and 20, 22 and 23, interest rate started to go up. Now, what does that mean? Well, when you have a higher rate, Less and less people invest in IPOs because they can go somewhere else and earn a higher return. One, that's two. IPOs don't make any profit. Initial public offering don't make any profit. So yes, initially in 2021, they started to deposit their money because they got the money from the investors. 22, 23, IPOs, all what they do is they consume cash, their initial public offering. That uh, initial public offering, IPOs at the beginning, they don't make a profit. They're based on the future. And IPOs don't need loans. So IPOs, they're not going to ask the bank to give them loans. That's why they got the money from the investors. And technology stocks are inverse performance with interest rates. So as interest rate goes up, okay, you have investors have alternative options to invest their money. They're not going to invest in tech companies. So those IPOs were not doing well. 
In addition to all of that, in addition to all of that, as interest rate goes up, remember the HTM bonds, held to maturity bonds, the value of these bonds go down. Let me explain. So let's assume in year 2000, 2020, interest rate was, just for the sake of uh, illustration, was 1%. And you invested, you had a million dollar to invest. So you invested this $1 million in government bond and you are earning 1%. In 2022, the government is borrowing money at 5%. Now notice, if you have a million dollar, you can take your million dollar and invest the money at 5%. Notice the Fed rate went from zero to 5%. Now what you do is when you invest your money at 5%, you earn 5%. So what happened to the old investor that invested their money at 1%? They're only getting 1%. The interest rate does not change. So the value of this held to maturity will go down because if you want to sell this investment today, it's worth way less because no one in their right mind will pay you a million dollar for something that's paying 1%. You can go right now to the market and lend your money to the U.S. government and earn 5%. So as interest rates spiked, so as interest rates spiked, as you can see here in 22, 23, those investments in HDM, HDM was happy earning 1.6%. They were happy because they had no other alternative. That what happened, the value of those investments went down. No big deal. Even if they went down, remember, we don't have to write there. We don't have to show the losses because they're held to maturity unless we are forced to sell them, unless we are forced to sell them. In case we are forced to sell them, we have a problem. Okay, and you know, this is what we're going to see what happened next. But before we see what happened next, I want to show you that if you look at SVB annual report, page 32, they clearly told us, they told you, the auditor told us, SVB told us that this is a risk. Notice here. We have experienced a significant growth during 21, 22, including deposit growth. We're going to see this in numbers on the next slide. Again, if we, again, experience deposit, deposit growth at similar or greater rate, then in the past, we may need to raise additional equity to support our capital ratio. Remember, if you have deposit, if you invest the money, you want to make sure that ratio is available in case the people wants to withdraw their money. We have experienced significant balance sheet growth, which we'll see on the next slide, beginning in 2020 through the first half of 2022. Follow with me. Failure to effectively manage our growth could lead us to overinvested or underinvested in our operation. Results in weakness in our internal control and give rise to operational risk, financial losses, loss of business opportunities, and loss of client satisfaction, invite increased regulatory scrutiny, and result in loss of employee, blah, blah, blah. So they were aware as they're growing fast, there's a risk in growing fast. And they're, they're telling you, we are growing fast. Now they're going to tell you where did that money came from. Much of the recent deposit growth was driven by client across all segments, obtaining liquidity through liquidity events such initial public offering, secondary offering, S companies selling stocks in their company and they're getting money and they're depositing their money as SVB. SPAC fundraising. Now, SPAC fundraising had a lot of money and I know a personal individual that works in this industry. He told me, literally, he had $300 million. He does not know what to do with. He was asking me if I need money for my company. I said, right now, I'm, I, I don't because I have no plan to grow. I don't have a plan to grow, but the point is they, they did not know what to do with money. And matter of fact, what this individual was doing, I'm just going to call him Matt for the sake of you know, illustration, right? So, so Matt, what he did, he was looking for businesses that need money. Take our money. We need to invest this money because interest rate was zero. So what he was looking for at the end, he was looking for companies that build swimming pools because there's a lot of shortage during 2021. Uh, in swimming pools. So if you want to build a swimming pool, you would have to wait six months or a year. So what he wanted to do to invest that money in these companies so they can grow. So the point is there was a lot of money flowing around. And I'm telling you, I know for a fact from a personal experience because I was offered money. I said, I, 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 I can't use it. I really can't use any money right now. Um, venture capital improvement, acquisition, and other fundraising activities during 21 and early 2022. Okay, why? Because interest rate was low and the government was dumping money through COVID, when, when COVID was taking place. Though these liquidity events and our deposit abated over the course of 2022, they started to slow down 2022. We are unable to predict whether this liquidity event will return to elevated levels. So that's it. we're not sure if this is going to stay and whether our prior level of deposit growth will return. And they're saying, look, we don't know if this growth will return. We're gonna see on the balance sheet next. Our level of deposit also depend on whether the client determined to keep proceeds 
from liquidity event and other fund and deposit product with us. So they were aware of that risk. They knew, they knew, they knew for a fact that at some point, that some point, these individuals may take their money out. Okay? Our level of deposit depends on whether the client determined to keep them. Okay? Although the client have historically retained a significant portion of their fund, client began to move more funds off the balance sheet in the second half of 2022. So they knew exactly the second half of 2022 that clients are taking their money out. And I told you why. Because IPOs, they consume money. As interest rate goes up, I IPOs don't do well. Interest rate goes down. So that's why they were aware of this. Okay, and they were aware of this risk. Now let's look at, now we can look at the numbers. Now we can look at the numbers and I'm going to focus on two, three accounts here. One is there, and by the way, this is this is in billion, but I had to superimpose 2019 and 2020 and they, they use a different format so I can show you the four year for the balance sheet. So notice, 2019, they had 6.7 billion in, the, in cash and cash equivalent, 17 billion, 14 billion, 13 billion. Again, again, this is, they're missing the zeros here because they changed the format of their balance sheet. So notice, I'm going to show you the numbers in a moment. There was growth in their cash and cash equivalent. Now, where did that money came from? Let's look at their deposits here. Under liabilities, we can look at their deposits, total deposits. And I'm combining interest bearing and non-interest bearing because they really, interest bearing and non-interest bearing, they pay basically minimal. They don't, they don't. They were close to paying zero percent on their deposit. They had sixty-one billion in the sixty-two billion, went up to one hundred and one billion in twenty twenty, one hundred and eighty-nine billion in twenty twenty-one. So notice what's happening to their deposits; it's growing substantially. And they went down to remember in twenty twenty-two, companies were start, uh, people were starting to take their money out, went down to one hundred and seventy-three billion. But if you compare twenty twenty-one to twenty nineteen, their deposit tripled. And sometimes you don't know what to do with the money. So what did they do with this money? Look what they did. Let's look at their HTM securities, health to maturity securities. They had 13 billion invested in 2019, 16 billion in 2020. That's fine. They went from 16 billion to 98 billion. So all, they took all this money that they got. They did not know what to do with it. And they deposit this money in health to maturities. And what did we know about health to maturities? Bonds, they are inversely related to, to, to interest rate. So notice interest rate goes up, the Fed fund went up, those funds started to go down. And at the same time, what's happening? People are withdrawing are, are withdrawing their money. So what would SVB have to do to meet those withdrawals? Sell H HTM. And what happened when you sell HTM? You are at a loss because those bonds lost value. Now, are auditors responsible for this? Absolutely not. The auditors are not responsible of how well you manage your investments. Auditors are responsible for how well you report your numbers, not how well you manage your investments. So notice here, there was a 161 increase in their cash and cash equivalent in 20, 20, 2020 to 2017 went down from 2021 to 2022 cash and cash equivalent. This is year to year. This is not a trend. This is year to year. But notice cash, their cash almost doubled over a two year period, cash and cash equivalent. So notice what happened to deposits went from 61, notice it grew by 66%, then another 86%, this is year over year, then it started to dwindle 2022. But if we compare 2019 over 2022 or 2021, it tripled. Now, what did they do with this deposit? And that's the problem. That's the problem. Held to maturities. They went from 13 billion to 16 billion to 98 billion. They did not know what to do with this money. Again, they invested it in health to maturities. What's the problem in health to maturities? Well, the, the problem, no, the good news is it's safe. The problem is it lost value. Why did it lose value? Because interest rate goes up. Those health to maturities bond went down. So they made a lousy investments. Now, let's look at the income statement. Again, I'm going to look at few figures. I'm going to highlight a few figures, but this is their income statement. Loans, income from loans. Well, that's fine. From between 20 and 2021, 20, their income from loans, which is the business that they are in, grew by 29%. That's fine. Then it grew to 3.2 billion by 63%, which is they doubled their income uh, over the over two year period from loans. That's fine. And that's the business that banks are in. Let's look at investment, investment income. Remember, they invested that money that they have, that they, that they have in bonds. It went from 635 million, notice, to 1.2 billion, which is a growth of 89%. Then it went from 1.1 billion to 
one billion, which is if you look at six six hundred million to one to two point one billion over a two year period, more than three times the growth. Why? Because they invested their money in HTM bonds and HTM bond pays interest and they had a lot of money invested there. And that's why you see the growth in their investment income, which is faster. Notice their investment income is faster than their business. A bank is in the business of giving loans. Yes, they make investments if they have extra money, but most of their money, most of the return, they were chasing yields. They were investing in bonds. Now, what's interesting is this. In 2021, gains and losses on investments. This is investments sold, actually sold. They have 421 million in 2022, 461 million in 2021, an 81% increase, which is fine. You sell investments and you make a profit. Notice what was happening in 2022. In 2022, they experienced 285 million in losses from actual sale. And this is where those credit agencies started to look at them. Now, why, why did they experience this? Why would they sell? Why would they sell at a loss? They needed the money to meet the depositors. And as depositors are taking out money and their HTM is going down in value, they are getting hammered. This is what happened to them. And notice this number here, 200, this is gains and losses. This is a loss, 285 million. In 2023, this number is going to be huge, and this is what led to their basically collapse because they had to sell those losses, they had to sell those HTM at a losses. And let's take a look at one more number, their interest expense. Their interest expense notice went from, which is, this is like their operating expense for a bank, you want to look at this, went from 60 million to 62 million, which is a 3% increase, which is fine. That's fine. Your deposit went up your interest expense goes up. Notice what happened between 21 and 22. It went to 862 million. Why? Because they had a, an increase of 1,290%. They had a large increase in deposits, which is good. You have large amount of money coming. But the problem is, what did they do with this money? They took this money and they deposited and held to maturities. So what would what, what's the best way they should have, have done? Just kept that money in cash. So if the people want their money, give them their money back. So what they did, they invested their money in held to maturity securities. Held to maturity securities went down in value. People came to get their money. They don't have the money. They have to sell those investments held to maturities, which they experience losses at. And this is the problem with H. TM. It's a liquidity crisis. What do we mean by liquidity crisis? It means they did not have enough cash to meet their depositors versus a credit crisis. What happened in 2007, 2008 is, is this. Let me show you the, the simplified balance sheet. Just to kind of illustrate the difference between the two crises. It's important. In 2008, 2009, these loans that they gave out, especially mortgage notes and mortgage investments, they were bad. These, these were hit. People were not paying their loans and the bank was experiencing, again, losses. And banks also invested in bonds that are related to those mortgage notes, which is mortgage-backed securities. And as a result, those bonds were losing value. So the problem is liquidity with SVB versus the traditional 2007-2008 crisis was a credit crisis. Um, if, you, if, you know, if I miss something, if you'd like to add something, please, this is, you know, based on public information, add in the, uh, add in the uh, comment, um, like the recording. If you're studying for the CPA exam, if you're an accounting student studying for your, um, accounting professional, uh, certification, please visit Farhat Lectures, um, subscribe to the channel. Good luck, study hard, and of course, stay safe.